I feel like the whole country needs to know what's going on here. It's bigger than alarming. This is the worst I've ever seen it. I witnessed this dystopian nightmare of this uncontrolled flow of desperate humanity crossing the border and converging here because of misbegotten policies by high leadership of the United States. When uh, President Biden took office, he signed some executive orders that basically halted all wall construction. It put our agents at risk. It put the migrants at risk. It incentivized the profit making for the smugglers. At the end of the day, this is a business. Billions and billions of dollars every month are earned from transporting people across into the United States. These kids are being exploited all along this track. There's nothing humane about any of this. In this room, obviously, we, we designed it to be as comfortable as we can possibly make it because the reality is no child should ever have to come to this exam room. Señora y mi hija están conmigo. We see a lot of violence as people are making across the border through Mexico or their countries. We see that devastation in, in the human lives. What happens if, if the family doesn't have the money to buy the plane ticket? Uh, well, FEMA reimburses says we can we can buy that ticket and and. Uh, so you it. buy the ticket for it. Yes. They were told they get a buy the American dream here, and um, that dream becomes a nightmare along the journey. We have 85,000 missing children. We don't know where they are. Under your new administration, what will you do and how will you go about finding these children? Well, I, I don't know how to answer that question. Um, it will be a priority. I mean, my whole life has been about protecting children. And uh, this is a, you know, this, these stories that I heard on the border, and I know that number, uh, are almost, you know, are things that I uh, emotionally find it a difficult to even process that these children are missing, that nobody would knows where they are. And, uh, you know, it's hard to even uh, imagine what their fates might be. So it's going to be a priority for me. I do not know how you, how we start going about that, but um, I, you know, that will be a priority for me. Well, thank you for changing your mind on the wall. You're welcome. Again. Craig Pasta Jardula, independent media journalist. Uh, according to U.S. Customs and Border Protections, 87% of the migrants that are coming to the border are still coming from Latin America. Why? Because the U.S. foreign policy has over 80 bases in Latin America. NGOs that pollute these areas, uh, funding murder death squads to overturn these countries. You said so yourself what happens in Guatemala as compared to Costa Rica. Why is there so much attention paid to what happens at the border instead of looking at the cause of migration, which is U.S. foreign policy? And also, too, as well, Mr. Kennedy, I think you know that the cartels, we learned this from Iran-Contra, are run by the CIA. So if you want to take uh, care of the cartels, shouldn't we be looking to Langley rather than Mexico? Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, that's one of the issues that I've taught, spoken, been very outspoken about from the beginning. That you know, one of the we do need to take take responsibility in our country for a foreign policy that has supported death squads in Salvador and Guatemala and Nicaragua for many years, that has supported military juntas, that has punished political leaders in those countries, in the countries of Latin America and Central America, when they try to initiate reforms, land reforms, education reforms, reforms that will empower the poor. And that will create a, uh, that will try to give the poor in those countries a leg up into the middle class. We should be encouraging those policies. That's what my uncle understood that. And that's why he, why he changed U.S. policy from supporting the most violent dictators in, in Latin America and Central America to supporting instead the Alliance for Progress, 
uh, the USAID program before it became a, a CIA front, and the, uh, and the Kennedy Milk program and nutrition programs for the poor, but also withholding aid from those countries unless they did land reform, unless they did you know, uh, medical improvements, education reform to the poor. That's what we ought to be doing in those countries instead. We continue to fund the death squads. We continue to encourage these austerity programs. You know, the large buildup of debt, the benefits go to the super rich oligarchs, and then the poor pay for the debt over generations. And, uh, and when the country is essentially bankrupt, we encourage and implement these austerity programs that further disempower and dispossess the, and alienate the poor. And a lot of the problems in, you know, that drive people to come to the border are the direct outcomes of those U.S. policies. So I, uh, you know, I've been thinking about those policies all my life. I've been to virtually every country in Latin America and Central America, beginning when I was very young. I've lived in Peru. I've lived in Colombia. I've seen the, uh, the, the outcome of those policies. I've told this story before that when my, my uncle had two of his favorite, the two favorite trips that he made in, in, when he was president, the first was his trip to Ireland. And that was a very, very emotional trip for him and for the Irish people. And when he left in, from Shannon Airport um, in the spring of 1963, his last words to Ireland that it was that he would return in the springtime, which of course he was not able to do. But the other favorite trip that he made was to Colombia. And he met this, the leader of Colombia, Yeres Caramargo, who was a populist leader, and who my aunt Jackie said was the most brilliant of all the heads of state that she and Jack met, met when they were in the White House. And they had met people like de Gaulle and Eamon de Valera, who was the liberator of Ireland and the George Washington of Ireland, a very impressive man. But she said none of them matched yet as Scott Margo. And two and a half million people flooded into the central square in Bogota and to, to greet my uncle with this incredible emotional outpouring. And yet as Scott Margo turned to my uncle and he said, do you know why they love you? And, yet, and my uncle said, no. And he said, because they think that you've put America on the side of the poor. And to me, that's where America ought to be. It ought to be on the side of the poor. Can we, are we committed to closing some of the bases, Mr. Kennedy? Excuse me. I was just, the follow up is are you committed to closing some of those bases that we are occupying land in Latin yeah, America? Absolutely. Those won't be some of the first bases. That there are 800 bases abroad. And they're not doing us any good. You know, we think that this is our, this is, this is our relationship with, with Latin America. We can control them by the bases. Well, guess what? China doesn't have any, any bases there. And the primary creditor today in virtually every Latin American country is China. All the business is being done by China. The engineers are being sent over are Chinese engineers. The roads are being constructed, the universities, the ports, by China, not the United States. The relationship and the friendship is with China. Brazil is switching to the Chinese currency. This, those bases have not helped U.S. security and they have not helped our business. We don't have engineers anymore that can design the roads or build bridges or build ports. Rice University used to graduate 20% of the engineers in the world. Now it graduates less than 1%. The engineers are coming from China. And that's good for China because they can build things and they can make deals and they can do business. They've made the decision to project economic power abroad, which is what my uncle did. He never sent a combat troop to die abroad. He was projecting economic power, and that's why throughout Latin America and Africa, there are more boulevards named after him, more avenues, more statues to him, more universities and hospitals named after him than any other president. And that is the strength of, of the real strength of a nation, when people around you want to be your friend. 
And you don't need to put bases in their country to ensure their friendship. And it's not, it's not winning us friendship. It's, uh, all it's doing is bankrupting the middle class in this country. And I'm going to change that. Mr. Kennedy, my name is Marion McKeown. I'm a reporter with the Sunday Business Post and BBC Radio. Uh, I would like to ask you specifically, and if you could be specific, I'd really appreciate it. Um, you speak about increasing border security, but I've been covering the border for quite a while. I spoke with one nun, Sister Norman Pometa, uh, who works in McAllen, and she said that these migrants who are coming, that it is like fleeing a burning building for them. She was specifically talking about women and children who were fleeing gang violence, domestic violence, poverty, the farms that can produce nothing because of climate change. And she said it doesn't matter how many borders you put up or how high, uh, that they will keep coming because it's a choice. They know what they're coming to. They know they risk death, that they risk rape, that they risk horrific journeys through the desert, but it's still better than what they're leaving behind. So how would you address that? Well, I would address it the way, you know, I think the person that you talk to is probably underestimating the role of U.S. foreign policy in fueling the destabilization of those countries and those economies that is uh, amplifying the poverty and amplifying all those reasons to leave. I also would say this to you, the, the, the evening that we were there, um, we only saw, we saw I think about 300 people come across and only two of them were from Latin America and nobody from Central America. So, and that may not represent what is typical. Uh, we found one Colombian family and one Peruvian family. And, but everybody else was, was from West Africa. They were from uh, Europe, Eastern Europe, and they were from, uh, you know, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, uh, Azerbaijan, and Tibet, Nepal, and China. So that, I, I think that may, you know, what you're talking about is an older model. And, you know, I've made this point before. There are very few people from Costa Rica coming across that border. And why is that? Costa Rica is the only country in Latin America that we've never invaded. Oh, you know, they, uh, Guatemala has never recovered from our 1953 overthrow of Yoka Jacob Arbenz, who was the most democratic leader in Latin America, but tried to nationalize the United Fruit Company, well, its land, with payments to them. And the CIA, you know, Alan Dulles at that time, before he was CIA director, had been the lawyer for United Fruit. And they had direct access to him. And they were able to initiate a U.S. coup against this guy who was the, you know, our Benz was the model of democracy in the hemisphere. We should have been supporting him. And the same thing is true in Nicaragua and El Salvador. We pumped, you know, um, billions of dollars into, uh, into funding death squads in those countries. And a lot of the, the terror and a lot of the poverty and a lot of the destabilization uh, and a lot of the oppression. You know, we basically financed a genocide against the Mesquite Indians in Nicaragua and El Salvador. We financed again and again uh, the, some of the worst slaughters in the history of Latin America during the 80s and early 90s. So um, I, you know, I think the, I understand that if you're standing at the border, you're seeing people who are impoverished coming across from Central America and Latin America and thinking there's nothing that we can do about poverty. But I, I think that there, I think our policies, I don't, create all the poverty in Latin America, but they have amplified the poverty and amplified the desperation of the people and, and, and restricted and, and fueled political oppression deliberately and purposefully, the kind of oppression that people legitimately are fleeing. M 
Mr. Kennedy, my name is Ed Rampell. I'm with the Hollywood Progressive. And uh, I have two questions, just real quick question. Last night on Turner Classic Movies, I saw a movie that made me think of your family called Winter Kills. I'm wondering if you have any comment on that film, if you've ever seen that movie starring Jeff Bridges. I have not. I'm sorry. Uh, I recommend you see it. Um, the, the other main question I have is that um, it seems today from your presentation that you're making uh, border issues and migration a cornerstone of your campaign, uh, which was um, in some ways similar to what Trump did in 2016. And there's been um, rumors bandied about uh, in the media uh, that um, you may end up running on a ticket with Donald Trump uh, as his vice president. So the, what, is, what is your response to those rumors? And can you definitively say you will never run on a ticket uh, for the White House with Donald Trump? Uh, in my experience, a lot of the stuff that you read in the mainstream news and the corporate news is what I would call conspiracy theories. <laughs> um, you're dealing with an entire industry made up of conspiracy theorists. And a direct answer to your question, no, I will not be Donald Trump's vice president. Good evening, I mean, good morning, everybody. My name, good uh, afternoon, Mr. Robert Kennedy Jr. My name is Gina Felix Goldman. I'm a journalist from Mexico. Uh, I went to the San Fernando Valley as a journalist and I asked everybody, a lot of people, what question would you ask the former president of the United States, which is you know, Donald Trump, and what would you ask the future president of the United States? And uh, I told him that I was going to be here and a lot of them are not able to be here because the majority in Pacoima, the San Fernando Valley, it's a low-income neighborhood, and they're working, they're cleaning homes, and some of them are even outside in the street working with the jackhammers. And they want to know, when will you be having an opportunity to come and visit Pacoima, the San Fernando Valley, Sun Valley, uh, Granada Hills, and the neighborhood where you really do have hard-working Latinos. There's a large percentage of Mexicans, large percentage of people from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. And uh, when you meet the president of Mexico, what kind of conversation will that take place regarding the border? So let me answer those questions. And let me actually start by um, to, the, to the previous question. They, you know, which started out with a, um, the previous questioner started out with a, the uh, observation that I, that this was a kind of, the border is a kind of Trump issue. And what I would say is this should not be a partisan issue. You know, I, um, as I said, I, I don't think it would be if people could see what I saw. I went down to the border feeling that Trump had made a mistake on the wall. Um, but, you know, I feel like people need to be able to recalibrate their worldview when they're confronted with evidence. And, um, and that we ought to be able to do that in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And when I'm president, what I'm going to do is bring in Republicans and Democrats and get the best Republican ideas and the best Democratic ideas and put everything on the table. And, uh, without and to avoid the kind of ideological pettiness that has, um, that has been so damaging to our country. And I think, you know, what we're seeing on the border today is the outcome of that. In the, 
is, is the outcome of, of ideology, a lot of it of political pettiness rather than, you know, really, rather than a, a comprehensive and thoughtful analysis of what we ought to be doing in respect to promoting the best values of our country and the, the best outcome for every American and for everybody else. And that's what we ought to be looking at it and not brand it Republican issue or Democratic issue, but just say, let's deal with this. It's an existential threat to our country and it's not good for the 16 million uh, illegals who are now living here and cannot legally get a job and cannot defend themselves. It's not good for the working people in this country in the San Fernando Valley and elsewhere who are now competing in their wages with people who can be paid $5 and $6 an hour because they don't have the political power to defend themselves, to demand a higher wage. It's not, that's, it shouldn't be a Republican issue. It shouldn't be a Democratic issue. There is no such thing as Republican children or Democratic children. We're all American and we need to. Uh, Now my, father you, spent a, so my, my father spent a lot of time in the San Fernando Valley, and I've been in the San Fernando Valley and in you know, most of the big towns that you mentioned, and I can't wait to go back there. My father told us when we were little, you know, he would take us to places like the Mississippi Delta, and he would take us to Bed-Stuy Restoration, which is one of the poorest um, neighborhoods in New York or to Harlem or Southeast Washington or to Delano to, you know, to visit Cesar Chavez or, um, or to Eastern Kentucky, Western West Virginia, where the poorest Americans were. And he would always tell us, he, he would say, the big shots in this country, the big corporations, the big millionaires, they have plenty of people to, to help them. They have lobbyists, they have attorneys, they have PR firms, and they own the politicians who can protect their interests. And he said, those people don't need the Kennedys. The people who need the Kennedys are the people that you're talking about. Those are our people. And because they don't, they don't have the lobbyists in Washington and they don't have the representation and the power in our political process. So those are the people that I want to represent as president, and I know the desperation. I haven't been recently to the San Fernando Valley, but I've been to a lot of places in this country that look like, and including eastern, uh, uh, eastern Ohio and western Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Cleveland, Ohio, and many, many other places. And I've seen the desperation that people, the working people in this country are dealing with. We're living in a country today where 57% of Americans could not put their hands on $1,000 if they have an emergency in their family. We're living in a country where 35% where of Americans do not make enough money to meet basic human needs, which is food, transportation, and shelter. The average income in this country for Americans is $5,000 less than the money it takes to survive. So how are people making up for basic necessities? $5,000 less than what is needed for basic necessities. And I've watched people you know, in Yuma, in the food uh, banks and in the grocery stores, change the recipes for their food so that they can make it through the grocery line. Uh, I, you know, I've seen my, one of my best friends just lost his food stamps that got cut to, uh, from $283 a month to $23 a month. And you can't live on that. And he is now, he sent me a text last night saying, I'm eating one meal a day. It's the only way I can survive. And there's so many Americans. And how are they funding that gap? That $5,000 gap, they're funding it with credit card bills. They're putting it on their credit cards to survive. And try to imagine a good end to that. They're paying 22% on average in their credit card bills. They, if, if, um, if the mafia did that to you, it would be called loan sharking. 
uh, for the banks, it's just business as usual. And, uh, and uh, Americans have the highest credit card debt that we've ever had. I think $1.3 trillion now and $330 billion were added in the last, during the Biden and Trump administration, the, the highest, you know, with the same policies in both administrations, the same economic policies that people are now, those, both President Trump and President Biden are running based upon those economic policies that have completely failed the middle class in this country. So if they win, you know, we can expect more of the same. And, but because their people are funding their lives on credit card bills now, they have to make tough choices. Americans, including those you're talking about, families are sitting, you know, in their living rooms at night and listening to a baby cry in the room next door and wondering whether that baby is $100 sick or $300 sick or $500 or $1,500 sick before they bring them to a hospital. And they're choosing between medicine and food. They're choosing between food and gasoline for their car. They're making these terrible, terrible, terrible choices every day, these nightmare choices, which is the opposite of the American dream. They're looking at a gas light or a, an engine light come on in their car and it is Armageddon for them. It's the end of the world because there's no way they can bring that car to a mechanic and get that fixed. And they're living in terror. And, um, you know, those are the people that I'm going to be representing as president. Hi, my name is Sue Carpenter. I'm a national digital journalist with Spectrum News based in Los Angeles. And I just wanted to know what is your stand on the registry bill, which would potentially give 8 million undocumented immigrants the ability to apply for permanent legal residency if they've been in the country for seven years? Oh, uh, what I would, I would put that bill on a shelf because I don't think the uh, I, for, I don't think it could pass Congress, and I don't think we ought to pass it in Congress until we've sealed the borders. And I won't, you know, I think once we've sealed the borders and we've assured Americans that the, immigra the illegal immigration has stopped, then we can look at an amnesty program. And, I, you know, it's, it's vital that we do that, something like that, for the people who are here in this country as quickly as we can. But we cannot do that realistically. We cannot go to the American people and ask them to do that before we seal the border. And it will never pass until we do that. Good afternoon, Mr. Kennedy. I'm Tony Coates from Long Island News Radio. How are you? Very well. Uh, it seems to me the question has to be raised about, you know, key bono. Uh, who benefits in this? It seems the Republicans raise a lot of money calling the Democrats permissive on the border. The Democrats raise a lot of money calling the Republicans heartless on the border. And what we don't have is any kind of responsible legislation in the hopper in, in the House or the Senate. So who's benefiting from this and why is there no action? Well, I mean, I think both parties benefit. And listen, if you really wanted to end the border crisis in a moment, in an instant, the, the most obvious thing to do would be to prosecute people who hire illegal aliens. Or the business of do, do that, if you did that, I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, you know, this is what we need to do right away, but I'm just pointing to the obvious. Nobody would be, nobody would hire them if people were going to, for, to jail for doing that. Put somebody in jail for doing that and it would end overnight. Why aren't we doing that? Because essentially lots of people benefit. And I think, you know, traditionally the Republican Party donors have been big corporations that benefit from low wages. And so there's a benefit there. And traditionally, the Democratic Party um, has, has uh, gotten the advantage of new voters, of people who are n newly immigrant are much more likely to vote for the Democratic Party. Although if you're an illegal immigrant, you can't vote. But you know the, the, I guess 
Anyway, there, there's plenty of reason to point to both parties, and, there, and we can point to both parties not only to answer the question, keep on up, but both parties have contributed to the, to the problem. There's also, you know, we didn't, and again, I'm just making an observation, but we had, when Ronald Reagan came into office, we had a, a million um, illegal immigrants in this country, and there wasn't a big border crisis. And the reason for that is we had a lot of, 30% of the, of, the, of the workers in this country belonged to labor unions. And the labor unions functioned to keep illegal immigrants from being hired. So if an illegal immigrant showed up at a work site, they didn't have a union card, they were illegal, they would be reported. And, uh, and there would be a response to that. And, um, the, you know, the destruction of the union movement in this country, whether you're for it or against it, uh, has, you know, by the, end, by the time Reagan left office, there were three million illegal immigrants in this country. And, you know, that kind of bulwark was withdrawn. And now it's 10% of our labor force is unionized, and, and that, those reports never get filed. Uh, I'm just talking about the history so that people can have some perspective on this, but um, both political parties have been instrumental in creating this crisis. And, you know, I, I want to deploy and mobilize both political parties to try to solve it. Hello, Mr. Kennedy. My name is Dan Nicewonder, independent media from Pasadena, also KPFK FM's Rebel Alliance News. And I'm the grandson of Swiss immigrants. And I know uh, you mentioned that most of the people coming across the border were coming because of money and not because of, because of political asylum. I know my grandparents came here because they wanted a new life here in the United States. That being said, the U.S. Congressional Budget Office own report that they released last year, from 1989 to 2019, the bottom 50% of the population economically was sharing 2% of the wealth. So we have to deal with these issues. And when there is a Kennedy administration, are we gonna see a sequel to the New Deal, new jobs programs, regulating Wall Street, securing Social Security? What, what do you uh, intend to do once you are president of the United States? Yeah, I, I, would, I mean, I, I'm a traditional Kennedy Democrat. I think the human dignity, and particularly dignity of the workers is, and the, and the, the, the American middle class are the foundation stones, not only of our economy, but American democracy. I grew up in a, a period in American history that economists call the Great Prosperity. It was a period of approximately, you know, 50 years, 40 to 50 years following World War II when the American middle class became the greatest economic engine in the history of mankind. So at the time that I was a young man, our country owned half the wealth on the face of the earth. And, um, and the American middle class was flourishing. We were producing products that everybody in the world wanted. You know, people, when I went abroad, people would do anything to buy Levi jeans that I was wearing. People wanted American cars in Europe. I traveled a lot with my father and my mother when I was little. And they wanted our electronics. You know, RCA Victrola and radios uh, and uh, transistor radios, and all these things that we had invented. And we were beloved around the world. People love the United States of America. When I went in 1964, I went to Poland with my dad. Poland at that point was a communist country. And the communists were, uh, my father went without permission from the government. We got the visa and crossed the border. But the Polish government, communist government, didn't want us there. And they were doing everything to make sure that the, the state-controlled press did not report our presence in the country. They never did. And in fact, one day we went to take a bunch of presents that we'd brought from the United States to an orphanage in Warsaw. And the government had removed all the orphans by the time we got there. So, um, and we went to Krakow uh, to meet the cardinal who was a, he was 
everybody knew that he was a saint. He'd been tortured and jailed by the communists, and he, uh, you know, he's an extremely reverential and pious man, and had been an inspiration. Um, he had, um, had inspired a resurgence in the Catholic Church in Poland, and he uh, and we went to his resident to the to the Cathedral of the Black Mariah, Black Madonna in uh, in Krakow. And we were waiting for him, you know, to meet this guy who everybody knew was going to be was going to be beatified as a saint as soon as he died. And we went actually in the kitchen. This is kind of a side story, but it's interesting. There was a priest who made uh, chicken sandwiches for me and my brothers, my mother and father. He spoke English, and he he wanted to talk about skiing and what skiing was like in the United States. And he um, and that priest who he spent the afternoon with before we were given the audience with Krakow later became Pope John Paul II. And but when nobody knew we were there, except people saw us when we went in, and when we came out, there were almost over a million people in the plaza outside the cathedral and they surrounded our car we were on the embassy vehicle and my father got us all to crawl out the window we stood on top of the car and I was uh, let's see I was a 10 year old 11 year old kid at that time and all I did all afternoon was sign autographs for people um, and they they shook our car they sang stolat to us which means may you live forever it's kind of a national a uh, song of an anthem of Poland. People were crying. This this wave of emotion was you know, it was extraordinary because they loved the United States. We were a moral authority around the world, and all of that was taken out of the growth of the American middle class. And every social scientist will tell you that without a middle class, you cannot have democracy. In, in nations where there's large disparities of wealth, of great wealth above, and then, you know, uh, an understory of widespread poverty below, is an economic configuration that's too unstable to support democracy. You need a middle class to have democracy, and we are losing the middle class in this country. Uh, and we need, you know, that, um, you know, my, I'm running for president because that is going to be the focus of everything I do to restore the American middle class, the economy, the good health, the end of the war economy, which is draining our country, the closure of these bases uh, and around the world, and bring that money home and rebuild America. Hello. Hello, Mr. Kennedy. My name's Melissa Tumim. I'm with the Santa Monica Observer. When President Biden recklessly withdrew from Afghanistan, he left behind our allies, women's rights activists, and lots of other people who participated in the development of the country that we fostered. When I was there in 2012, I would ask people, um, a lot of Americans think we're only here to take Afghanistan's resources, and every single one of them responded to me, Look around. All of this is because of America. I love America. We rebuilt Afghanistan and gave them hope, gave them a promising future that Joe Biden withdrew when he took our minimal forces out of the country and left them to the tyranny of the Taliban. And on top of that, as a volunteer with Freedom Birds, an organization which had um, obtained airplanes to help evacuate our, our most vulnerable allies. They couldn't operate because they had no place to land. The Biden administration refused to grant refugee status to Afghans. And it is my understanding that the only people being turned away at the border currently are Afghans. How will you correct that? How will I correct allowing Afghans into the border? I, you know, I, how, will you, how will you correct the refusal to give Afghans refugee status because no other country will take them as long as the United States well, refuses we have, to grant we have, them that status? Yeah. 
We have, first of all, I would disagree with you. I think I don't disagree with you that our withdrawal from Afghanistan was caused tragedy in that country. Um, at that point that we withdrew, we only controlled a very small part of that country inside of Kabul. Most of the provinces of Afghanistan were already controlled by the Taliban. And uh, we had been in, it's our longest war. It's even longer than Vietnam. We were there for 20 years. In my view, we shouldn't have gone in at the outset. Um, it's, you know, we cannot be the policemen of the world in this country. We, we cannot run other, the other countries have to be responsible for, for their own governments. And we can't, there are many, many bad people in the world. And it's not the job, you know, Jonathan, John Quincy Adams spoke for all the framers of the Constitution when he said, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Because they understood that if we have an imperium abroad, we could not sustain a democracy at home. And we would turn into a security state, a garrison state, a surveillance state, and we would lose our democracy. We're borrowing to stay in Afghanistan we're, we borrowed six billion dollars a day from the Chinese and the Japanese. We're weakening our country. We're the, and the middle class pays for that through the hidden tax of inflation. We don't have the money. And we can't, you know, we're acting like, like the alcoholic who, who uh, you know, who's behind on the mortgage payments and is, is taking the milk money and buying rounds in the bars for strangers. You know, that's how we're acting as a nation. And we need to take care of ourselves here at home. In terms of your, you know, the question about uh, Afghans being denied at the border, we have a law in this country that says if you are being per politically persecuted and you are f fleeing political persecution abroad, that you are entitled to stay in the United States of America. That's the law. What I will do as president is I will appoint immediately enough judges so those cases of the Afghans and others can be fairly adjudicated at the border swiftly to let the people who are actually fleeing political persecution into this country as quickly as possible. We have time for just one more question. And then afterward, we have a really important announcement, so please stay. Seated. My name is Alberto Godinez. Mr. Kennedy, it's an honor to be here, and I'm immigrant proud to be an American. Thank you. After today, before I do my question, after today, I will change party and support Kennedy 20, uh, 24. <laughs> after 25 years of be working on the media in Los Angeles, I retired because I got tired of the fake media. And I decided to do my own Spanish program, Caiga Quien Caiga. And here's my question to you. Uh, also, I'm proud to be an Scientologist. <laughs> so, but my, my, my question to you is this. The border seems that it's not a problem. Uh, the problem, if we don't stop the problem, from Guatemala, Central America, South America, and even from Mexico, if we don't create political, if we don't do something right in Mexico, in Latin America, people will be crossing. There's not, it's not gonna be any wall that is gonna stop people crossing and coming to the States, uh, to the States, because when there is a need and there's a crime, people will fly no matter what, and nothing will stop them. My questions to you, Mr. Kennedy, you are willing to work with uh, other countries to uh, prevent the people inviting the United States. In, that's my question to you. Are you going to... Uh, I, I, absolutely. And we have... Today, we have the worst relationships around Latin America that we've had. I mean, they, we're, in some ways, the neglect that we've... Uh, you know, that, uh, that we've treated, with which we've treated Latin America, particularly Central America in recent years, has probably been helpful 
because our former policy was so catastrophic. It, when, when they were the center of our attention during the 1980s and we killed millions of people, not in wars, but literally murders, you know, with death squads, government, state-funded death squads of the poorest people in society, priests, nuns, attorneys, professionals, law professors, targeting people, the intelligentsia, uh, targeting the poor, the Indians, farm workers, etc. cetera. Um, and those were catastrophic. And, uh, and they're still living with the legacy of, that, of those actions. But I really, my uncle and father, one of their top foreign policy priorities was Latin America. That's why they started the Alliance for Progress. That's why they started USAID to change the relationship that the United States had had for decades, for centuries, with Latin America into a, into a partnership. And uh, instead of a, you know, instead of like people have said, 80 military bases, we need an economic partnership. And, uh, and we need a partnership that is going to help support the economies in those countries in ways that is not going to punish workers in the United States and that is not going to cause these waves of immigration of, of uh, desperate people coming across the border. Oh, I thank you for your question. I think it's really important, and I, you know, I want to make that pledge to you that that will be one of the primary priority, foreign policy priorities of my administration. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Thank Kennedy. You. Today I change party and I support Kennedy 2024. <laughs>